Okay, in this video, I'm going to go through the excerpts of uh, Hobbes's Leviathan to be found in this, the Stephen M. Kahn second edition of Classics of Political and Moral Philosophy. Um, and I'm going to go through them chapter by chapter and just point to um, very important passages and sort of try and orient those passages in the big picture. The big picture I've discussed in a, a, another video using uh, Sharon Lloyd's PowerPoint slides. So here I'm just going to tell you which particular readings in the ones that we've got um, are most important. Now, of course, you have to read the whole thing because you've got a quiz on it and you've got a quiz on things that I'm not necessarily going to talk about in this video. Uh, so this doesn't get you out of doing the reading, but it will tell you which passages are particularly relevant. So we got our Khan, I got my reading glasses on, I got my cup of tea, philosophy is enlightening, let's go. All right, starting with part one of man. Um, as I mentioned in the other video, uh, and Hobbes talks about in the introduction, the Leviathan is divided into four parts. And parts one and four are uh, the resolutive part of what he calls his resolutive compositive method. What that means is they're the parts where he breaks down um, a system into its component parts to see uh, where there are problems. And of course, the context of Leviathan is that England is in the great crisis of the English Civil War um, and obviously needs fixing. There's something terribly wrong with the political system. So he's breaking down... Um, a commonwealth, a, uh, which is a set of people gathered together in a political organization into its component parts and trying to locate in those parts the source of the problem that he is facing now. And of course, uh, England is by no means new, unique in this. Uh, the many commonwealths have gone through similar problems. So it's not totally specific to England, it's just that was the most pressing issue for Hobbes at the time. Um, so part one is called Of Man. This is where he looks at uh, humans as units because they are what make up a commonwealth. And he starts um, at the very beginning with uh, some metaphysical discussions of uh, the nature of matter. As I mentioned before, Hobbes is a materialist. He believes that the universe is composed only of matter made up of atoms or whatever. There is no such thing as mind, as a separate entity. So as I also said, uh, Hobbes was a critic of Descartes. Literally, a, uh, his criticisms of the meditations are published at the end of the meditations with Descartes' response to them. Uh, Hobbes is a materialist to the core, and that comes out in the early chapters, where he goes through and he explains in a very materialist way, uh, a sort of primitive kind of neuro, uh, neurochemical analysis of um, mental states, among other things. Uh, what is imagination? What is uh, mental discourse? What are all these things like endeavor or appetite or desire or contempt? He gives an entirely uh, mechanistic interpretation of all of these things. And this is very important to the big picture because uh, one of the sources of disorder that uh, Hobbes is most concerned with is the uh, and this comes out in the frontispiece of the Leviathan. This is uh, Hobbes designed this himself and insisted that it be at the beginning of the uh, original English edition of the Leviathan in 1651. As uh, and as I said in the other video, there's a division between terrestrial or civil power and authority and 
religious power and authority. Uh, you know, the castle represents the seat of civil power and the church the seat of religious power. And having two sources of power, one to govern your terrestrial or bodily existence, the other to govern your eternal and spiritual life, that is a cause of great dissent and is the key cause of the English Civil War, uh, uh, the key contributing factor. So it's important to stress for Hobbes that there is no such thing as an eternal soul. So, um, you know, any religion that tells you that your soul is in their hands uh, is leading you astray. And of course, a religion that does that can um, compel you to go against the, the king or your political leaders because they just control your bodily existence. And if you believe in an immortal soul, that's just the blink of an eye and much less important than your uh, heavenly existence. So the beginning parts of the Leviathan sound like um, the kind of thing that you read in Philosophy 101 or early modern philosophy where you talk a lot about what the nature of matter is, like when Locke discusses primary and secondary qualities and things like that. Um, so Spinoza actually does a very similar thing. We're not reading Spinoza. There is Spinoza in, uh, in this book, in Kahn. Um, his great work is called The Ethics. And but the early chapters of the ethics are like this. They're like a discussion of the nature of being, uh, what the universe is composed of. So it seems like uh, this doesn't seem like a work in political philosophy to begin with. It, it seems like he's going way too small. It's like, uh, you know, if you started a political science class by examining brains and things like that. That just seems like w maybe way too uh, fine grained. But this is the way Hobbes approaches it and it's important to his overall picture. However, perhaps um, the first uh, chapter that is more obviously directly political politically related is chapter 11 which is on page 388 in Khan where he talks of the difference of manners where he defines manners as those qualities of mankind that concern their living together in peace and unity okay so this is obviously of great importance given his project to find the causes of instability in um, in a commonwealth that have led, led for example to the English Civil War so what is it um what is it about humans that makes them squabble what is the sources that are going to tear at a commonwealth from within and one of the uh, most important claims that he makes and this is uh, about a th just over a third of the way down uh, the first column on 389 in chapter 11 in the first place, I put for a general inclination of all mankind a perpetual and re restless desire of power after power that seetheth, seetheth only in death. Uh, Hub says we are driven. Now, is he saying that everybody is like this? Not necessarily, but it is a common enough feature of humans that we are driven uh, to want power, to try and dominate our fellow human beings. Uh, kings do it. Even kings whose power is the greatest turn their en endeavors to the assuring it at home by laws or abroad by wars. Um, in others, uh, and when that is done, there succeedeth a new desire in some of fame from new conquest, in others of ease and sensual pleasure, in others of admiration or being flattered for excellence in some art. This is his basically psychology he's doing psychology of humans and he says this is the way this is a feature of humans that causes problems politically competition of riches honor competition of praise fear of death uh, so these are things that can lead astray but can also be the beginnings of designing a system that is stable for example, fear of death is mentioned right at the bottom of the first column. And fear of death 
could be used by uh, a monarch to threaten uh, the populace into obedience um, because they don't want to die. But of course, if there are transcendent interests, such as your interest in, in your heavenly existence, um, then even fear of death can be overcome and, and it can't, you can't necessarily just threaten the populace into submission. So that takes us fairly naturally into chapter 12, which is of religion, um, because religion is a major um, element in living together in a society, um, particularly, of course, in Hobbes's time, where every country in Europe, more or less, was Christian, and then there were the uh, countries of the, the eastern countries that were Muslim, and uh, the the king and the religious leader, uh, if they are not united, they can cause problems, as we saw in the in the English Civil War. Now, his chapter twelve is interesting because it is a um, an analysis of the causes, the sources of humans being religious. So uh, this is something that later thinkers like Freud and Marx would also take up. They would give their explanations of why it is that people believe in God. Freud famously says that God is sort of a father figure, a projected father figure. Uh, Marx said uh, religion is the opiate of the masses. That is, it's something that is an indication that humans are suffering and it's an attempt to ease that suffering um, because it tells us that even though our life in society is horrible, our reward will come in heaven. So according to Marx, if you if you have a society with a religion, it's a sign of a society in crisis because you wouldn't need a religion in the perfect communist society. And in fact, religion will just fade away uh, when when the political um, problems have been fixed. Now, both Freud and Marx, of course, are atheists, whereas Hobbes, uh, Hobbes has been accused of being an atheist, but he would very much dispute this. And uh, he is he regards himself as a uh, an enlightened Christian, that is a Christian who truly understands how Christianity should be interpreted. And as I may have mentioned, book three or part three of the Leviathan is almost entirely scriptural analysis. So it goes through the Bible with a fine tooth comb and explains why his materialist interpretation is the correct one and why the Bible, for example, supports um, his uh, preferred political system of absolutist sovereignty. Uh, that is very rarely excerpted in compilations like Khan because, as I said, it's, it's basically Bible scholarship. It's not really what philosophers normally do, which is arguments. So the rest of uh, books one and two always get excerpted because they're more to do with uh, the kind of thing philosophers do, argumentation. Um, so, but it's an interesting account. Um, uh, in the bottom of the first column on page 391 in chapter 12. And in these four things, opinion of ghosts Ignorant of second cause, ignorance of second causes, you see a phenomenon, you don't know its true underlying cause. Like, for example, uh, thunder. You know, you hear thunder and you don't know what really causes thunder, so you attribute to it um, a, a supernatural cause, like Thor or something. Uh, ignorance of second causes, devotion towards what men fear, and taking of things casual for prognostics, consisting consisteth the natural seeds of religion um, now so these are the seeds of religion these things are psychological features that are natural to humans and as he says this is not true of other animals you don't find other animals praying why not if you know god could have made animals pray too presumably uh, but the reason they don't is because they don't have these particular psychological features. So they, they don't come up with the idea of religion. Now, notice it's very easy to read this chapter as kind of atheistic because it seems to suggest that rather than God creating us, we have created God. Um, 
but as I've said, Hobbes uh, doesn't explicitly say that. And whereas, well, whereas I'm sure some readers, uh, some atheist readers of Hobbes would be perfectly ready to impute, to make him a fellow traveler and say, uh, this is an athe uh, a smart atheist who's dealing with a bunch of religious lunatics. He can't piss them off, so he can't let them know that he's an atheist, but we can pick it up from what he's saying here. Certainly, there are readers of Hobbes that say that, but there are also equally readers of Hobbes who say, no, he's he's perfectly um, serious in his Christianity. He's just got a version of it that is unusual in that it's materialist. Um, so, chapter 12 is about uh, how religion can be, how, how religion emerges, and once we understand how religion emerges, we can uh, take steps to ensure that it doesn't become a, a destabilizing force. Chapter 13 is very important, one of the most important chapters. Uh, it begins with a discussion of uh, equality on page 391. And as I mentioned before, it's, an, it's a different form of equality. We're used to thinking, uh, certainly if you're used to the uh, American Bill of Rights or Constitution saying that um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. What does that mean? Um, the usual interpretation is that it doesn't mean that we are identical or even similar in our natural abilities. Some people are smart, some people are beautiful, some people are strong. Um, and other people aren't, but that doesn't affect their equality. We should re so in other words, the kind of equality uh, in the Bill of Rights is supposed to be a normative equality. Even if people are, some people are weaker than others, they, we should regard them as political equals. Whereas with Hobbes, it's pretty much natural equality. And he says, for as to strength of body, the weakest has strength enough to kill the strongest. So in things that matter, we are equal in strength. Now, of course, you might wonder, well, that's not true of babies. Uh, it would take a, a demon baby to be able to kill us. Um, so, and it's not true of uh, people who are handicapped. So what does he mean that, by that? But it's important to note that at this point, Hobbes does not want to appeal to normative notions. So it would be kind of anathema to him to say that we have these things, natural rights, which are sort of, um, they are the state, uh, the kind uh, well, look at what it says in that statement. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So God provides, uh, God, it is because of God that we should be regarded as equal. Hobbes doesn't want to, he does go on to talk about the laws of nature, and uh, and we'll get which are which we can sort of regard as religious dictates, but he also doesn't want to impute to us things that cannot be proven by a kind of empirical scientific scientific method, and uh, he would want to say, well, how do you know we should be we should be regarded equally? How would you ever prove that? Um, you could work it out from uh, laws of nature, but what law of nature would undermine, would, would undergird that? So in other words, Hobbes is very much taking a sort of scientific approach and saying, let's look at humans as they are and, in, uh, and not rely on things like our, in, uh, not at least at this stage, rely on things like our interpretation of religious texts or inspiration from God to 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 support our um, fundamental political truths. Let's see if we can gather them from scientific looking at the way humans actually are. And he says, looking at humans as they actually are in their natural state, which would be kind of a pre pre civilized uh, existence, they are basically equal. Equal in body and equal in mind. And as he says, you can tell they're equal in wisdom. Uh, this on page 392. Almost all men think they have in a greater degree than the vulgar, than average people. 
If you ask anybody, do you have more wisdom than the average person? They will all say yes. Um, the, that is, then all men but themselves and a few others whom by fame uh, or for concurring with themselves they improve. In other words, they will allow that some people are smarter than those, them who are famous, like Einstein or something, and other people who agree with them must be smart because they agree with them. Um, for such is the nature of men that Howsoever they may acknowledge many others to be more witty or more eloquent or more learned, learned, uh, yet they will hardly believe that there'll be many so wise as themselves. And he summarized, uh, so that it says, therefore, we have an equality of wisdom. For there is not ordinarily a greater sign of the equal distribution of anything than that every man is contented with his share. Every man is contented with his share of wisdom, so it must be equally distributed. A little bit dubious, but... Uh, that's what he claims. So we are, in that sense, equal in mind and equal in body. Uh, and from this equality of ability arises the equality of hope in attaining our ends. Everybody thinks they should get their fair share. They should they should get uh, an. They are entitled to an equal share. And this is the cause of problems. Um, so the next column, we have uh, a, another very important passage just above halfway down. So that in the nature of man, we find three principal causes of quarrel. First, competition. Secondly, diffidence or, uh, or fear. Uh, and third, glory. The first maketh man invade for gain. That is, you are competing with other people and you will therefore invade their space. The second, you will invade people's space for safety because you are naturally fearful. You're worried that other people will attack you or rob you. So you will strike first. And third, glory. Um, and the third for reputation. In other words, you want glory, you want reputation, so you will attack others. So all of these elements, all of these drives are naturally in humans that will cause uh, great instability. This is why the life uh, and actually the most famous quote in all of Hobbes is on the next page 393 which is his description of life in the state of nature which is life before the establishment of a political system or a commonwealth and uh, he says uh, well still on page 392 just below the, the description of the three principal causes of quarrel he says because humans have these three principal causes of um, quarrel, this means that the state of nature, that is natural pre-political existence, will be a state of war. By its nature, it will be a state of war. And he doesn't mean that there's actually fighting. Uh, war consisteth not in battle only or of the act of fighting, but in a tract of time wherein the will to contend by battle is sufficiently known. So you can say that people are at war because you know that they, their natural drives, uh, those three uh, causes of quarrel, are making um, the breakout of fighting imminent at any time. It's, uh, you know that because there is nothing to stop that, there is nobody keeping the peace. No one of, of, because everybody is equal, there is no one above them to say, hey, cut that out. So they are going to be at constant risk of um, fighting. This is why, we shall very shortly see, humans are driven to create a political system. So Hobbes is a social contract theorist, which means that he says, if you are to justify political society, you have to justify it by um, from a baseline of equality. You can't just, as for example, divine's, divine right of kings theorists at the time, a near contemporary of Hobbes uh, uh, that Locke spends a lot of time criticizing is a guy called John Filmer, who uh, defends divine right of kings. He argues that the correct political system that God intends is that we follow the king because the king is chosen by God. So, in other words, some of us, you and me, 
are born inferior to the king. Our nature is that we are politically inferior to the king. So there isn't a natural equality, according to someone like Filmer. Whereas Hobbes believes there is. But of course, if Hobbes believes that we are naturally equal, then he has to explain, he either has to be an anarchist and say no political system is ever justified, which he certainly is not, or he has to explain why um, any political inequality could be justified from this baseline state. And he does this by saying that uh, we are drawn, we are driven by our reason, by as rational actors, much like modern economists say we are, we see, we are confronted by the horribleness of the state of nature slash state of war. And we come up with a solution, which is to bind together, to covenant together, and to form a society where, which will thereby create this authority over us, which will resolve disputes and keep us safe. So rational actors from a state, from a baseline state of equality, will agree to give up that equality to be safe. That's the basic picture that of Hobbes's uh, contract theory. And we'll see uh, that Locke also has a contract theory and also has a description of the state of nature, but his description of the state of nature is very different. Hobbes's, for one thing, has no justice. There is no justice in the state of nature. There is no property in the state of nature. Uh, look on the second column on page 393, still in this very important chapter. To this war of every man against every man, this also is a consequent that nothing can be unjust. There is no such thing as justice or injustice in the state of nature. The notions of right and wrong, justice or injustice, have there no place. There is no such thing as a natural justice. Justice is a creation of political society. So in order to have justice, you have to first create a commonwealth. Only within a commonwealth can you have notion, even notions of justice. Outside of them, they're just made up, they're fictions. And the same with property, uh, as he says further down. It is consequent also to the same condition, that is of, of being in the state of nature, that there be no propriety, property, uh, no dominion, no mine and thine, sorry, mine and thine distinct, but only uh, that to be every man's that he can get, and for so long as he can keep it. So we have this notion, even little kids have this notion, of something being mine. This is mine. Uh, and, in, and Hobbes says, no, in the state of nature, nothing makes it yours except that you can hold on to it. And if somebody bigger than you takes it away, I guess it wasn't yours. It's theirs now. So there's only possession. There is no such thing as property. Property is another normative notion that that should belong to me. Uh, and whereas possession is a descriptive notion. If you're holding it, it's in your possession. There's no sense of that you have a right to it. You just have it. So you've got possession in the state of nature, but you haven't got property. Um, Oh, yeah. So the, the famous quote is uh, the description of life in the state of nature. Uh, t -t 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 this, uh, let's read the whole passage. It's a very long sentence, is it? In such condition, this is uh, four lines down on page 393. In such condition, there is no place for industry, no point in us uh, working, because the fruit thereof is uncertain. Suppose, you know, like little red hen, I work all day to make to grow things and to make bread. Somebody's just going to watch me and think, great, when she's done, I'm going to kill, kill her and take it. And I won't have to work. So knowing that that's a constant risk, why would anybody ever work? Um, and consequently, no culture of the earth. Nobody will make art because, you know, it could be stolen. No navigation. No use of the commodities that may be imported by sea. No commodious, that means comfortable living. No instruments of moving and removing such things as require much force. No knowledge of the face of the earth. Nobody's going to do science or math. Uh, no account of time, no arts, no letters, no society. And which is worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And here it comes. 
and the life of man solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Um, somebody made a famous quip once about a British philosopher that he was nasty British and short, which is a, a good burn if you're a philosophy nerd. Um, okay, so the state of war, because of these causes of quarrel that are natural to humans, will be like this. So we'll, we want to get the hell out of there. Um, now, he does say that there are laws of nature. Okay, so as he says, uh, there, so these are the causes of quarrel. Does that mean that we're forever screwed? Well, obviously not, because we have created political societies and we've had great, great civilizations. So how did that come about? Well, towards the end of chapter 12, he says, the last paragraph on page 393, the passions that incline men to peace are fear of death, desire of such things as are necessary to commodious living, and I hope by their industry to obtain them. So because we also have these, these psychological attributes, that's going to drive us to find a solution and get out of the state of nature. And reason suggested convenient articles of peace upon which men may be drawn to agreement. These articles are they which otherwise are called the laws of nature, whereof I shall speak more particularly in the next chapter. Okay, so the laws of nature. There is much dispute amongst uh, Locke scholars as to the uh, status of the laws of nature. And he doesn't help much. He does say at the end of... Uh, where is it? Um, yes, the end of chapter chapter 15 of Other Laws of Nature, right before we begin part two in our excerpt on page 405, he discusses the status of the law of nature. What are these laws of nature? Laws according to whom? Clearly, they are not laws created by humans. Those can only come about, those are called civil laws, and those can only come about once you've established political society. But pre-political society, which is the state of nature, where do these laws come from? Well, they're basically laws that Locke says, I'm sorry, Hobbes says, are self-evident. You can work them out by the use of reason. Okay, but are you saying, is he saying that they're like uh, laws of physics that you can observe just by observing um, the way the world operates you can work out that force equals mass times acceleration or something like that uh, is that what he's saying that they like that they are like, that he's uncovered sort of the gears of the universe here um, he doesn't quite say that because as you can see they're not like that they're not uh, they're more like um, some of them are like good pieces of advice uh, so what he says is, first he, he says that they're dictates of reason. He says they're, um, the true doctrine of the laws of nature is the true moral philosophy. So insofar as there is such a thing as morality outside of society, then this is the best you're going to get, he says. Most morality takes place in society once we have constructed uh, a political system. So most moral laws are actually uh, what are called positive laws, that is they're um, human creations. But if you want to say that there's something above and beyond the sort of civil laws, the uh, legality that we make in society, then the laws of nature are your best bet. But he's not, he doesn't sort of have a, a Kantian view if you've studied any Kant. He certainly doesn't suggest that they have this sort of rigid uh, like status of mathematics or something like that. He says the dictates of reason, you can work them out as being reasonable. And he also suggests that they are prudential. They are things that any smart, uh, any smart creature would want to follow to survive. So the laws of nature have this weird kind of, oh, and he does also say that God would agree with them, but he doesn't, he he, uh, he says, and yet if we consider the same theorems as delivered in the word of God, that by right commandeth all things, then are they properly called laws. So that sounds kind of weak. He does he he doesn't actually say that they are commanded by God 
although he is going to argue later on that you can find reason to believe that in scripture uh, he just says you know if we were to consider them as delivered by god um well there you go that's the status of the laws of nature uh so we're on chapter 14 um the first law of nature uh, well there's a right of nature consists in the liberty or uh, in uh, a liberty to do or to forbear and you have a right to do just about anything that you want to do to survive uh in the state of nature which of course you give up to enter political society because if anybody had that in political society it would be chaos uh, the laws of nature, uh, um, law and right differ as much as obligation and liberty. Um, so right is your liberty, law is your obligation. Okay, the it is a precept or general rule of reason, this is chapter 14, bottom of the first column on page 394, that every man ought to endeavor peace as far as he has hope of obtaining it, and when he cannot obtain it, he may seek and use all helps and advantages of war. Again, how do we know this? He says, well, from my, anal from my previous analysis of uh, the way that, he what a rational human being is like. And if a rational human being is like the way that I've described them, then this makes sense, that if you are a rational, it it's kind of like the laws of economics. You will, um, you know, try and maximize your indifference curve or whatever. Uh, why? Because you're a rational being. If you're a rational being, you will seek peace. Why? Because you recognize that the state of nature, the state of war, is horrific. Uh, the first and fundamental law of nature, top of the column on page 394, uh, which is to seek peace and follow it. The second, the sum of the right of nature, which is by all means we can to defend ourselves. So we have the right to defend ourselves and we should seek peace and follow it. From this so that's the fundamental law of nature. From this fundamental law of nature from which men are commanded to endeavor peace is derived this second law that a man be willing, when others are so too, as far forth as for peace and for defense of himself as he shall think it necessary, to lay down this right to all things and be contented with so much liberty against other men as he would allow other men of himself. Anarchists say, why would you ever enter society? You give up your freedom. Uh, why would I let the man boss me around if I could live outside of society? Well, Hobbes's answer to the anarchist is, because outside of society you won't live, you'll die quickly. Um, so anybody sensible it's true. Outside of society, you have the right to do whatever you want, but so does everybody else, and they're going to do it against you. So, sure, entering society requires you giving up something, giving up the, the right to do whatever you want as far as uh, you want. But in return, you get security, you get life, and that's worth it. Um, and you Now, you're not going to give up your right to liberty unless others do as well because you regard them as equals and that would be unfair uh, but so long as everybody gives up this right to the common part to be delivered to the common authority the commonwealth uh, then it makes perfect sense to do it um okay i'm going to uh skip over this discussion of covenants yeah, covenant, that's very important, but I don't want to, I don't want this to be more than about an hour because no one will watch it then. So the, the discussion of covenants is important uh, that, um, oh, one important thing, covenants entered into by fear, this is second column on page 397, in the conditions of mere nature are obligatory. This is important. Normally we would say if somebody holds you up if somebody holds you to ransom and you agree to pay, pay the ransom, that doesn't bind you because they have no right to threaten you. And any, any promises entered into by force are non-binding. Now, this would be a definite problem for Hobbes if it were true, because part of the reason that you give up your right 
in the state of nature is because you feel threatened and you are under duress. So if uh, covenants made under duress are not binding, then it looks like the, the covenant that, you know, founds, uh, found society is not binding. Whether or not that's a problem, a great problem for him is another matter, because once you have set up society, it automatically has an authority and it's going to compel you anyway. But uh, he does say this, that, uh, he, and he gives the example of a ransom, that it is binding, you know, so you can't say, I was under duress, so therefore I don't have to pay it. No, you do. Um, oath, if you swear an oath, that actually adds nothing. As he says, um, a covenant, if lawful, binds in the sight of God without the, the oath, uh, and if unlawful, bindeth not at all. And um, essentially, he says that words mean nothing without power to back them up, which is why we have to establish a, uh, a political system, something to have the power to back up our covenants made. Uh, another thing that he's going to return to, top of first column on page 398, a covenant not to defend myself from force by force is always void. Now, there's this tension in Hobbes. On the one hand, he looks like he's justifying uh, a, what we would regard from our contemporary viewpoint as a horrific system. It's a, an absolutist uh, sovereignty and probably a monarchy. So an absolutist monarchy where the monarch, if it is a monarch, would have control over just about anything. There's no separation of powers. Um, that seems abhorrent. That seems like it would lead to tyranny like that. Uh, so that's the one side where people, where, for example, anarchists or libertarians would have a big problem with him. But on the other side, monarchists um, would, uh, and, and there were contemporary critics of Hobbes that said, the Red Leviathan, and said this is just a, a, a roadmap to rebellion. Because he says things like this, that you you cannot give up certain rights and that if if somebody comes to kill you if the if you know you've done something wrong you deserve the penalty of death if somebody comes to kill you you have the right to resist them because uh even in the state why did you what was the sole point of joining society from the state of nature it was to preserve your your life so you can never there would be no point in being in society if society leads to your death. So interestingly, what would Hobbes say about, say, police brutality? Do people who live in neighborhoods that are uh, that are often victims of police brutality, do they have to take it? Do they have to obey the law and, you know, not fight back? No, they should fight back. If, if, uh, if the law itself is going to um, kill you, you have the right to fight back. Okay, so, and that of course comes from his analysis of us starting in this state of equality. Uh, of the other laws of nature, this chapter 15 contains another very famous passage in Hobbes, which is the discussion of um, the fool. Now, this follows his introduction of the third law of nature right at the beginning of chapter 15, that men perform their covenants made. And very importantly, he says, this is the law that is the basis of justice. Justice. Now, how does this fit with the um, the, w what he said earlier? of there being no justice of, to this war of every man against every man. This is also consequent that nothing can be unjust. That was on page 393 in the, uh, in the previous chapter, no, in chapter 13. Well, so what's the root of justice? Well, um, this requires, uh, the, the thing about this is that you can't be sure in a natural state that people actually will perform their covenants. Um, it's only when you have a society uh, and a system set up to 
uh, enforce these covenants that people actually will. So in effect, you can't rely on people keeping their covenants in the state of nature, which is why there's no justice and no propriety. But once you get into political society, the already existing law of nature can be enforced. And then in effect, you actually do have justice and propriety because now you you have a something what is it that we want our political system to enforce? It must be this previously existing standard, the law of nature. So this tells us what our political system must be set up to enforce. So it must pre-exist the establishment of the political system uh, and be the reason why we would establish the political system. So we want a political system to enforce covenants made. And in fact, that's all there is to justice. Uh, then therefore, before the names of just and unjust can have place, there must be some coercive power to compel people equally to the performance of their covenants by the terror of some punishment. Now, even in a political system, you can get free riders. So, for example, suppose I pay my taxes um, and I get a benefit out of it and somebody figures, hey, I can get away with not paying my taxes. I can cheat my taxes and I can still get the benefit. Um, this is someone who would be a major problem in society. If enough people thought this way, it would undermine society. Uh, and this is the fool. The fool is like Thrasymachus. If you've ever read book one of Plato's Republic, uh, Thrasymachus comes forward and says, well, justice is just whatever you can get away with. That's all that justice is. Any fool that believes that you have to keep your covenants, they're just a sucker and I'm going to take advantage of them. If you have people thinking like that, then you're never going, then society is never going to stay together. So uh, now Hobbes in calling him the fool is referring to a passage of scripture where I think St. Paul says the fool hath said it in his heart, there is no God. So this is meant to directly par parallel this. And in fact, he says the same fool hath said it in his heart that there is no God further down on page 399. So the fool hath said it in his heart, there is no such thing as justice. In other words, I don't have to follow covenants. Um, so what are we, what is Hobbes's response to the free rider who says, you know, this is just bullshit. I don't believe that I have to follow covenant. I'm going to go back to the rule of, uh, of doing everything I want to survive. And he says, uh, so he poses himself the challenge, whether it be against reason, against the benefit of the other to perform or not to perform, you know, so suppose you've got a benefit, do you should you now do your duty to help contribute? Or should you try to escape without doing it? Is it uh, uh, the fool, the fool says, well, obviously, you should try to get away from it, because you know, who wants to do something when they've already got the benefit? It's obviously rational to avoid it, says the fool. Whereas Hobbes says, I said is uh, not against reason to to do your duty to like pay your taxes. And he gives uh, at least two reasons. For the manifestation whereof we are to consider first, that when a man doth a thing, which notwithstanding anything can be foreseen and reckoned on, tendeth to his own destruction, however some accident which he could not expect arriving may tend it to his benefit, yet such events do not make it reasonably or wisely done. In other words, if you could get away with not paying it, it would just be an accident. So you can't rely on that. And you would be stupid to rely on that. But more importantly, secondly, that in a condition of war wherein every man to every man for want of a common power to keep them in or as an enemy, there is no man can there is no man can hope by his own strength or wit to defend himself from destruction. Um, Sharon Lloyd, I remember, in said quoted Greg Kafka, who uh, is a was a philosopher who in the eighties used Hobbesian. Uh, tools to analyze the arms race, nuclear power arms race. She said he had a great turn of phrase for this point. Um, it was that time wounds all heels, or where a heel, of course, like in wrestling is a bad guy. So in other words, uh, what Hobbes is saying here is you'll get a if you freeload, you will very quickly get a reputation for being unreliable and nobody will do business with you. Apparently, um, very few construction companies would do business with Donald Trump. 
because he never paid his debts. He's notorious for never paying his debts. So consequently, fewer and fewer people would do business with him and fewer and fewer banks. The one bank that would deal with him is Deutsche Bank. Uh, and the per Deutsche Bank loaned him a huge loan. And who was the person who approved that loan? It was the son of former Chief Just uh, former Justice Kennedy, who was amazingly persuaded by Donald Trump to take early retirement. Huh. Anyway, so he would be the example of a heel that, well, time has yet to wound. So maybe Hobbes is being, uh, uh, is being rather optimistic here. But that's his point. He says, if you believe you can get away with it, you won't because people you will get a reputation. You would need the ring of Gyges that uh, is mentioned in Plato's Republic to get away with it. Uh, which means a ring whereby you could be invisible, and most people don't have those. Okay, uh, so the fool answered uh, about a third of the way down um, the second column on page 400. Justice, therefore, that is to say, keeping of covenant, is a rule of reason by which we are forbidden to do anything destructive to our life and consequently a law of nature. Okay, there's a whole lot more laws of nature, all of which are important, but I don't want to get bogged down because we're already going to run over. Uh, he says, now, there's at least 14 laws. How do we remember them all? He says, um, page 404, first column, about halfway down. Uh, actually, a third of the way down. The there are the laws of nature dictating peace for a means of the conservation of men in multitudes, and which only concern the, doc the doctrine of civil society. There be other things tending to the destruction of particular men, uh, but not necessary to be mentioned. And though this may seem too subtle a deduction of the laws of nature to be to taken notice of by all men, are you going to convince all men that there are these 14 rules that just reason tells you must apply uh, probably not it's too subtle a destruction of the laws of nature to be taken notice of all men whereof the most part are too busy in getting food and the rest too negligent to understand yet to leave all men excusable uh, in other words how can we summarize this because we don't want people breaking these rules and yet to leave all men inexcusable they have been contracted into one easy sum so hey, you dummies, if you can't understand all 14 of these rules, here's the big picture. Here's the rule that summarizes all of them. Uh, intelligible even to the meanest capacity, even to the stupidest person. And that is, do not that to another which thou wouldst not have done to thyself. This is not quite the golden rule. That is, do do unto others. That's the positive thing. Do unto others what uh, you would like them to do to you. It's the negative version. It's don't do to others what you wouldn't want them to do to yourself. So that's the law of nature. All right. That's part one. So part one is uh, resolutive. It's breaking down uh, humans into their comp society into its component parts and finding the problems and possible sources of solution. So the problems were the sources of quarrel and tendency towards religion. And the solutions are these uh, laws of nature that tendeth men to seek peace. Okay, part two is compositive. It's building from these, uh, it, you've got, so it's like you've got a broken engine. You take it to pieces and you lay all the pieces out and you examine them, you clean them and polish them, you find the problem. Part two is compositive. It's putting the engine back together so that it works. Uh, and ideally will not break down in the same way again. So part two is where he constructs a political system. Uh, of the causes, generation and definition of a commonwealth. Um, the final cause end of or design of men. This is chapter 17, page 405 who naturally love liberty and dominion over others, in the introduction of that restraint upon themselves, in which we see them live in commonwealths, is the foresight of their own preservation. So why would people who in their natural state are free and equal and love freedom and equality, why would they ever leave that? Um, 
uh, and introduce laws that they've got to follow. Why would they, you know, why would anybody do that? Answer for the reasons that we've seen, because they're smart enough to know that if they stay in this uh, existence of freedom, they will, their lives will be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Okay. So, um, oh yes, in this chapter 17, as in many other places, Hobbes rails against Aristotle. Now, this is not to think that, say that he thinks Aristotle is stupid. Of course he doesn't. Nobody could. But Aristotle is... Aristotle dominates all philosophy in the time that Descartes and Hobbes are writing. Um, he, uh, Aristotle had influenced what, it, when you see Hobbes refer to the schools, that is the universities that basically teach, um, Aristotle as philosophy. Aristotle was referred to as the philosopher for centuries. Like he's the, the end of philosophy, philosophy, you know, sort of thrashed about a bit. And then Aristotle said, let me tell you the answers. And it was the truth. So we don't need to try to change philosophy, Aristotle's got all the answers. And that's essentially what was taught in the schools. It was taught, you know, if you want to understand things, let's look to, to Aristotle. It's, it's a bit like um, you know, secular theology. In theology, you know, how do, what's the answer to this? Well, let's look in the Bible. In philosophy, how do we answer this? Well, let's look in Aristotle. That's what the schools taught. Um, so people read, Hobbes knew that people reading him would probably think, well, that's not what Aristotle says, so this guy can't be right. So uh, Hobbes occasionally takes aim at Aristotle and argues why, in fact, he's wrong, which, of course, is very bold. But Hobbes is nothing if not bold, at least on paper. And that happens, for example, on page 406, where, if you remember, um, when you read some Aristotle earlier in the semester, uh, Aristotle says we're political animals. We naturally exist in, in societies like ants and bees. And uh, Hobbes says, no, we're, we're not naturally political. We're very different from ants and bees. We are, f we are e little units that will compete with each other instead of, instead of like ants who, who no worker ant, despite the movie Ants or even A Bug's Life, no worker ant would ever say, this sucks. Why do I have to do all the work when the queen just lays there and gets fed? That doesn't occur to an ant. It just does what it's supposed to do. An, ant, an, an individual ant is no more independent than your kidneys are independent. Your kidneys don't decide, hey, I got the worst job in this body. I'm going to leave it and go uh, branch out on myself. No, they don't. They're just part of a system. Same with an individual ant but not the same for humans, says Aristotle, says Hobbes. Uh, so, but near the bottom of page 406, first that men are continually in competition for honor and dignity. That's not true of ants, that's one difference. Amongst these creatures, the common good differeth not from the private. That is, an ant doesn't think, well, what's good for, there's what's good for me and what's good for the colony, and these two things don't line up. An ant wouldn't make a distinction. What's good for the colony is what's good for the ant, the individual. Uh, third difference, top of the second column on 406, these creatures, ants or bees, having not as man the use of reason, do not see or think they see any fault in the administration. No ant is going to say, I could be a better queen than this bozo. Um, whereas humans are always saying that I could run things better. Fourth, uh, these creatures, though they have some use of voice, don't have uh, silver tongues that can stoke unrest. You know, there's no, there's no Bernie Sanderses of the ant worlds going on saying, you know, the 1% have too much. Five, fifthly, irrational creatures cannot distinguish between injury and damage. And uh, uh, injury is where someone has done you wrong. Damage is where just something bad happens to you. Uh, so if you believe that someone has injured you, you want uh, you, you want revenge or you want to be reimbursed. But there's no such concept amongst creatures. Uh, lastly, the agreement of these creatures is natural. That of men is by covenant only. That's the big difference. Um, 
then we have the very covenant. The covenant. The, this is the social contract happens. Uh, 406, page 407. Um, the only way to erect such a common power as may be able to defend them from the invasion of foreigners and the injury of one another and thereby to secure them in such a sort that by their own industry and the fruits of the earth they may nourish themselves and live contentedly, is, here's what we do, to confer all their power and strength upon one man or upon one assembly man. Notice that it, uh, it often sounds that he's arguing for a monarch, but he does allow uh, the sovereign can be an assembly. So the sovereign doesn't have to be a single individual, uh, although, of course, looks like a single individual but there of course uh this it is composed of all the people who contract so this is the leviathan that he mentions on page 407 um okay to confer all their power and strength upon one man or upon one assembly of men that may reduce all their wills by plurality of voice unto one will which is as much to say to appoint one man or assembly of men to bear their person so we need to establish a decision maker. Famously, George Bush said he was the decider. Well, we need a decider. In the state of war, you need someone to make the decisions and, and say, here's what, how we solve this dispute. Because without that, it's war of all against all. Um, it is So, top of page 407. This is more than consent or concord. It is a real unity of them um, all in one and the same person. So, we remember there was a, a, a great um, fuss when Mitt Romney was running for president and he said corporations are people. Um, well, uh, Hobbes would agree that Persons don't have to be just individuals. Persons are things capable of making decisions and pers every person has a will. And he says that the Commonwealth must act as a person with a single will. Um, whether that be, whether the Commonwealth be in the body of a single individual, like a monarch, or a body, uh, like a, a republic. Okay. Um, so... The essence of commonwealth is defined in italics just over halfway down first column on page 407. It's one person of, remember, that doesn't necessarily mean a monarch. It just means that a body or individual who is the single source of decisions of whose acts a great multitude by mutual covenants with one another have made themselves every one the author. So even when the decisions of the uh, uh, sovereign go against you, Hub says you can't complain because that's your will. You are part of the body of the sovereign. So your will, you might take it as against yourself, but really it's your will just as, because you're part of the, um, of the commonwealth. Uh, to the end, he may use the strength and means of them all as he shall think expedient for their peace and common defense. Um, and he that carrieth this person is called sovereign and, and said to have subject, sovereign power and everyone besides his subject. Uh, okay, what else can we say? Uh, rights of, oh yeah, there are two kinds of sovereign. Uh, again, this is still in this chapter. Uh, two, two kinds of commonwealth. They can be established by force or they can be established in this way by social contract. Uh, if they're established by social contract, they're called political commonwealths or uh, and they're sovereigns set up by institution. So in a political commonwealth, uh, a body of people recognizing that life in the state of nature is impossible, um, covenant with, e with each other to establish a monarch. That's uh, sovereigns by institution. The alternative is sovereigns by acquisition. That's when um, when an already existing sovereign takes over a group of people and you, you sort of join up with the uh, existing commonwealth, say, as a, a satellite. If, for, so that might be if one country invades another. Um, the rights of the sovereigns, uh, you are not obliged... So, 
first, uh, about a third of the way down, second column on 407, chapter 18. First, because they covenanted is be understood, they're not obliged by former covenant to anything repugnant. You can't make a new um, covenant. Second, next page, 408. Uh, they make the covering by covenant only of one to another and not of him to any of them. So remember, justice is the breaking, uh, it involves covenant. So injustice is when you break covenants. Here's an important point that Hobbes makes. The monarch can never be unjust to any subject because the monarch has not covenanted with individual subjects. This is very important. What has happened is that the all the individuals that make up a, a commonwealth have covenanted with everybody else. So it's an agreement of all with all to grant power to uh, a particular individual, say if it's a monarchy. But the monarch, him or herself, has not... This, this uh, granting of power is not a, itself a covenant. It's like a placing in trust. Uh, the now the monarch has all the rights to decide that originally were owned by every individual to decide for themselves. They've given those up and given them to the monarch to make decisions for them. But the giving of the rights to the monarch was not a covenant. So there is no covenant to break with your subjects, so you cannot be unjust to them. Um, if you voted for a different uh, number three. Thirdly, is on the halfway down the second column on page four hundred eight. What if you voted for a different monarch? Uh, does that mean you don't have to follow this one? No, because when you uh, covenant to to form the sovereign, part of that covenant is uh, agreeing to accept the will of the sovereign and the will of the sovereign must be by majority vote. So there's sort of two stages. The social contract is forming the commonwealth, which is this body. And then the body as a whole has to decide who gets to be the new decider. Now, in a democracy, they never transfer the right to a further body. They keep it. So in a democracy, you're at you're, you remain at the first stage whereby a commonwealth exists and the will of the commonwealth is majority vote. It's only in an aristocracy or a, um, or a monarchy that you transfer it. Uh, thirdly, because the major part hath by consent. Yeah, so, uh, so you, if the... Um, you might say, well, I never wanted a monarch. I wanted it to stay at this stage. Uh, too bad. By giving yourself up, uh, you, have dis you have given your right to choose an individual up to the body as a whole, and the body as a whole decided to institute a monarch. You have to obey. Uh, fourthly, because every subject is by this institution author of all actions, and all judgment of the sovereigns instituted, it follows that whatsoever he doth, it can be no injury to any of his subjects. Again, you can't, whatever the whatever the uh, sovereign decides, you can't complain. It's your decision as much as anyone else. If the king comes to steal your money, you might object to that, but you might not be as convinced by Locke's by Hobbes' reasoning here. Uh, no man that has sovereign power can justly be put to death. You can't execute the monarch. Uh, Sixthly, two thirds of the way down, first column on 209, 409. It is annexed to the sovereignty to be judge of what opinions and doctrines are averse. This sounds sinister. You're allowed to censor. The sovereign can decide, mm, I'm sorry, I don't want you disseminating uh, socialist literature. Uh, so Bernie can be silenced um, because. The sovereign has the right to ensure peace. And of course, remember the context. Uh, if you watch that little 10 minute video about the history of the Civil War, there was a lot of subversive doctrines being spread about at the time. So presumably Hobbes has that in mind. 
uh, yeah, the summary of that second column on page 409, it belongeth therefore to him that hath the sovereign power to be judge or constitute all judges of opinions and doctrines as a thing necessary to peace, thereby to prevent discord and civil war. That sounds a bit totalitarian. Uh, seventhly, is annexed to the sovereignty the whole power of prescribing the rules whereby every man may know what goods he may enjoy. In other words, the rules of property are in the sovereign's hands. This is something Locke would very much disagree with. But uh, whether or not we have a welfare state, whether who owns what, it is up to the sovereign to decide. So the system of property is what the sovereign says it is. Um, this propriety be necessary to peace and depending on sovereign power is the act of that power. These rules of propriety or meum and tium, mine and yours, and of good, evil, lawful and unlawful in the actions of subjects of the civil laws. So there is no sense, um, as a libertarian would say, a libertarian would say, you can't tax me because it belongs to me. Uh, taxation is theft, says the libertarian. Bullshit, says Hobbes, because you had no property in the state of nature. You just had possession. But the idea of uh, that something by right belongs to you doesn't exist in the state of nature. It is a an entirely political creation. So if the king says 90% of your goods shall be taxed for the public good, you can't complain because you're getting 10% more than you would have in the state of nature. Plus, you're getting peace and security. So, Hob this is Hobbes' answer to the libertarian. It's just a fairy tale to suggest that you had a right to anything before the institution of uh, the sovereignty. Uh, an eighth judi judicature judiciary we would normally we would say um tenth the choosing all counselors the power of giving honors like the queen's list um all of these things belong to the sovereign so uh, lastly uh two-thirds of the way down page 410 is the twelfth of the the initial rights of the sovereign now these first 12 that he has listed are inalien, excuse me, inalienable. Uh, as you probably know, inalienable means cannot be given to anyone else. You cannot transfer any of these rights. And this is a very important point in Hobbes. Uh, certain, for, he says they are inalienable and they are a unity. If you take away one of them, it's like you've destroyed all of them. So they come as a group, these t uh, 12 sovereign rights. Why? Um, as he says, and so if uh, this is about halfway down, uh, just before halfway down the second column on page 410. If we consider any one of the said rights, we shall presently see that the holding of all the rest will produce no effect in the conservation of peace and justice, the end for which all commonwealths are instituted. In other words, if you, if you give up one, the other 11 are useless. And this division is it, whereof it is said, a kingdom divided by itself cannot stand. If you try to separate off, say, the judiciary and put it in another body, apart from the sovereign, you have destroyed the point of the Commonwealth. Hobbes is absolutely and adamantly opposed to systems like we have in the United States of division, separation of powers. You can't separate the powers and you cannot limit the powers. If you do, you will set up a mini version of the state of nature. What was the cause of the trouble in the state of nature? These differences uh, of opinion over whether or not that's mine, whether or not it's yours, what I have a right to. The, the whole point of a commonwealth is to get rid of disagreements like that, to set up a single decider. But if you give somebody else power over this decider, We've got the state of nature again, and it will inevitably end up war between these things. Um, now, you might say the solution we've come up with in the uh, in the United States is political parties. So the same political party 
can control, for example, the Senate and the Supreme Court and the presidency. And then they get along, strangely enough. They don't encroach on each other's power. Uh, but when separate parties control it, then you see butting of heads. Um, so uh, it is a major theme in Hobbes that because of his analysis of the source of disorder, that the solution and the whole point of a, of a commonwealth is stability and anything that undermines that stability is anathema. So he states that very clearly the, uh, this section, you can't have divided sovereignty. Uh, this next chapter, chapter 19 of the several kinds of commonwealth. I'm not going to go into that. That's the, uh, oh, on page 412, 413, there are, um, yeah, actually, let's say a little bit about chapter 19. Here's, in, we've seen in both Aristotle and Machiavelli that uh, this claim that there are six political systems. There's uh, good, many, democracy, bad, many, anarchy. Uh, good, few, aristocracy, bad, few, oligarchy. Good, one, monarchy, bad, one, tyranny. Hobbes says, no, there's just the good three. Those are the only three that really exist. And he says the other three are just the names that people who disagree with them give them. But actually, there's no difference in fact. Um, he says, this is at the bottom of page 411, there are other names of government in the histories and books of policy, tyranny and oligarchy, but they're not the names of other forms of government, but of the same forms, disliked. For they that are discontented under monarchy call it tyranny and so on. So he says, no, there's only three. Um, and furthermore, now which one is preferable? He says, well, you can have working versions of all three. There's a slight preference for monarchy, and that's what he's gives, he gives uh, five reasons for why monarchy is to be pre pre preferred, starting on the second column of page 412 and continuing on to the first column of 413. So, for example, uh, though monarchy, whoever beareth the person of the people, beareth also his own natural person. The public and the private interests are most closely united. You might say, well, really? Uh, isn't it possible to have, say, a real estate agent take control of the sovereignty and further his own interests against the goods, uh, uh, the interest of the many? Well, not in a true monarchy, because there would be no separation. You would have no private life if you were a true monarch. So there would be no way to sort of feather your own nest independently of the glory of the country. So the the state c'est moi l'état c'est moi i am the state uh, so therefore my reputation depends on the good of the state and the glory of the state uh anyway you can look at those they're fairly straightforward they they are not knock down reasons in favor of monarchy they're just reasons um that make it more advisable uh, he does consider one main one major flaw in monarchy what happens when an infant uh, comes into line of the throne, you know, like uh, when the king and queen die and their firstborn is still a baby. Uh, isn't that a problem? What do we do then? Whereas the good thing about aristocracy is they're not all going to die at once. So there's sort of a constancy to aristocracy where the the sovereign is Im imbued in a in a body of men, you know, Maybe one or two of them might die at once, but you can then the remainder of them can still act as a choosing body to replace those. So it's like a, I don't know, a constantly self-healing set of cells that is never going to be killed all at once. Whereas a monarchy can be killed all at once and you have to have very clear instructions about the line of succession. Otherwise, that's a major cause of uh, instability, fights over who gets to succeed. Um, you know, can tear a country apart. So that is a major point against monarchy. He tries to give an answer to that, but um, I'm not sure it's particularly uh, convincing. That's why he, he talks a lot about line of succession, because it's a major problem for monarchy. Then he, in chapter 20, he talks about uh, the two kinds of uh, 
sovereignty by acquisition. Remember, there's sovereignty by institution, which is when you get a social contract, and then you sovereignty by ac acquisition, where an, uh, you come to have a sovereign because it takes over the country that you're in. Most people would say, well, that's illegitimate, so therefore you don't have to um, you don't have to obey it. And he says, no, because even then, even in the case of that, basically you are covenanting because you don't have to, if you don't like it, you can continue to fight and you can go away. But if you, uh, if you would rather give in to conquest than, um, than to fight for yourself, then this is very similar to the reason by which you, for which you left the state of nature in a, in a sovereignty by institution for your own safety. So it is binding in the same way. Remember, if you covenant under force, or un, uh, it's still binding, just like in the ransom case. Um, okay, so discussion, uh, he makes it clear that um, he's in favor of absolute sovereignty that no division of powers because if you've given away any of the rights of sovereignty the rest of them are worthless and you you will get these divided sources and people will bicker so he says and though of so, this is uh, first column on page 420 and though of so unlimited a power men may fancy many equal evil consequences yet the consequences of the want of it which is perpetual war of every man against his neighbor are much worse the conditions of uh, man in this life shall never be without inconveniences, but there happeneth in no commonwealth any great inconvenience but what proceeds from the subject's disobedience and breach of the covenants. So it's better. It's always going to be better. Even if you have a, a, a tyrannical king, it's better to be in that than in um, the state of nature. Uh, chapter 21 of the liberty of subjects this is where his his definition of liberty right at the beginning of chapter 21 page 420 liberty or freedom signifieth properly the absence of opposition by opposition I mean external impediments of motion and may be applied no less to irrational or inanimate creatures than to rational so the liberty of a human is like the liberty of a river it is at less liberty if it's bound by its banks. Um, notice that this definition of liberty doesn't imbue it with the same kind of significance as you might say a Kantian has. Kantians talk about autonomy and freedom as, as your own will and so on, and that there's a value in realizing your own will. And uh, Hobbes is ever the empiricist and, you know, saying Hobbes is always pointing out that humans are just one system of atoms amongst other systems of atoms. He is very down to earth. So liberty is not to be regarded as something mystical and, uh, you know, spoken of in hushed terms. We just want not to be told what to do. We want not to be restricted. Um, and of course, it is that that we have the most of in the state of nature no restrictions but of course it's terrible because everybody else has no restrictions and they'll get in your face and steal your stuff so um what he says liberty is consistent with a bunch of things that most people would say it's not consistent with look at top of page 421 liberty fear and liberty are consistent so another as when a man throweth his goods into the sea for fear this is a famous uh, example in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, and he, here Hobbes is actually agreeing with Aristotle that you are free. Because suppose you've got a cargo of expensive goods that you're taking from one place to another. And that's your living. You, want, you, you really want to get the goods to their destination because otherwise you won't get paid. And you've already paid for the goods. You're hoping to sell them at a higher price. You see a big storm coming. You think, oh my God, if the storm hits and I'm laden down with all these goods, I'm low in the water, I'm going to sink and die and all the money in the world isn't going to be any good to me. So you throw the goods overboard to make the, the um, to raise the boat in the water so it's less likely to sink. 
Did you do so freely? Were you free in throwing the goods overboard? Some people would say, no, you were acting under com compulsion. You were forced to by circumstances. And if you forced, you can't be free. Hobbes would say, no, you didn't have to do that. You could have accepted the consequences. You were acting voluntarily. You were free. So f fear and liberty are consistent. Liberty and necessity are consistent. Um, that is, so in the actions which men voluntarily do, which because they proceed from their will, proceed from liberty, and which because every act of man's will and every desire and inclination proceedeth from some cause. Yeah, if you take philosophy 101, you will uh, talk about uh, freedom and determinism, and they are apparently at odds with each other. Hobbes is one of the very first compatibilists who says that determinism, the idea that every effect has a cause, is totally compatible with freedom. Someone like um, uh, libertarian, metaphysical libertarians, which is not the same as political libertarians, metaphysical libertarians say, if my action is caused, uh, then I am not free because I couldn't have done otherwise. I can't affect, I can't decide on the laws of nature, so it's not up to me if my action is caused by the laws of nature. Um, whereas Hobbes would say, sure it is. You're free. You're, you're not being forced to. All that it is to be unfree is to have um, people force you, essentially. Uh, but if, it's, if you're being forced by the laws of nature, that's still free. That's how you work. So here's what is called a compatibilist, if you've ever come across that. Uh, other famous compatibilists are other British philosophers like Hume, David Hume and John Stuart Mill. Uh, and opposed to them tend to be continental philosophers like uh, like Kant, most famously, is not a compatibilist. Um, so if that's all that liberty is, then uh, what you want is a system that tries to maximize that consistent with the same liberty for all. And a good analogy for that is when um, you set up rules of the road. Rules of the road, uh, in some sense, restrict your freedom. They tell you what you're not allowed to do. So in, for example, in America, you're not allowed to drive on the left. Uh, is that a restriction on your liberty? Well, in some sense it is. It stops you doing something. There is one thing you cannot do. However, the result of this is actually to increase your liberty given that there are other people around. Because if everybody tries to, if, if everybody tries to uh, maximize their liberty and drive wherever they want to drive, nobody's going to get anywhere. You will just get gridlock and, you know, people will be free, but it won't do them any good. So to, you give up a little bit of freedom to achieve more actual freedom of movement than you would have otherwise. And that's essentially what you're doing in the Commonwealth. Um, now, do we give up all our liberties when we uh, enter, when we have a sovereign? No, we have the liberty to disobey. Uh, in certain respects. And these are listed on page 423, second column, and uh, thereafter for a, a few columns. Interestingly, you do, you can uh, agree to be killed. That is perfectly legitimate. Um, but you cannot be forced to kill yourself. And you cannot be forced to give in when somebody comes to kill you. You are free to resist. Uh, he said, top of the second column, uh, bottom of the second column, he says, I have shown that in the 14th chapter, as I mentioned, covenants not to defend one's own body are void. Therefore, if the sovereign command a man, though justly condemned, to kill, wound, or maim himself, suppose you have been condemned to death by a, a court of law, uh, and you say, okay, kill yourself. Or not to resist those who assault him, or to abstain from the use of food. Uh, yet that man hath the liberty to disobey. So these are liberties that you cannot give up. And he talks about some more of those. Have a look at that.
So for example, if the sovereign banished the subject during the banishment, he is not subject. Because if, if you've been sent away from, you are no longer part of the Commonwealth, that person no longer has control of you. You're in a state of nature. You're, you know, you're already badly off. Why should you make it worse by having to follow things that somebody else says? In the state of nature, at least you're free. So uh, if you are banished, as used to happen, um, you don't have to obey the sovereign anymore. However, if you're sent on a message, if you're just sent somewhere, you're not banished, you do have to obey the sovereign because you haven't broken, you haven't, uh, your covenant has not been broken. And there's an interesting example on page 424. Suppose a great many men together have already resisted the sovereign power unjustly. So they've broken the law. They should be punished uh, or committed some capital crime for each one of them expected death. Do they have the liberty to join together and assist and defend one another? So it's like a band of outlaws. Are they allowed? Are they violating the laws of nature if they band together and say, hey, yeah, we're all under sentence of death. Let's work together and try and fight off the police together. They have that freedom. You're, sure, go for it, he says. So again, this is the part of Hobbes where the where monarchists say, wait, wait a minute, you're giving them way too much freedom. Um, of the things that weaken or tend to the dissolution of a commonwealth, chapter 29, the, uh, this is where he keeps using analogies with diseases, which is rather good. Um, one, the first one is those that arise from an imperfect institution. So one cause of instability is if the sovereign, in order to sort of butter up the citizen, says, well... I haven't got that much power. I'm going to restrict my power so I, I don't scare you too much. And Hobbes says, no, that's stupid. You've got to have all the power that you can because if you don't have enough power to protect yourself, there's no point in having it at all and we might as well be back in the state of nature. So it is disaster for a state to have... It'd be like a, a teacher that's too nice who, who lets the kids get away with too much. It's not going to work. The teachers have to maintain power. I remember that in school. I remember there was a teacher who was particularly fierce and, scared and, and feared by all the kids, Mr. Salt. And I remember hearing a kid say respectfully, oh yeah, he keeps us in our place. It's like, why would you, why would you respect him for that? But Hobbes would totally get it. He says, no, um, you need someone to control things and you need someone to have enough power and... It, the worst thing in the world is to have a weak uh, ruler who cannot protect or cannot maintain peace. Because the only point in doing this is to have peace. And, if, and that is the grounds on which you have covenanted, is to secure peace. If the, if the monarch no longer can secure peace, your covenant is broken. You don't have to. Uh, uh, the, the commonwealth is dissolved. Because that's the point of setting it up in the first place. Um, so that would be a source that would destroy uh, the Commonwealth. The, the rest of them are seditious doctrines, which, are, which include uh, that every private man is judge of good and evil actions. Hey, this sounds a bit Christian. He rejects that because no, 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 that's what you gave up when you joined the Commonwealth. Whatsoever a man does against his conscience is sin. Again, sounds like Christian. Sounds like uh, sounds very much like Martin Luther King. Hobbes would have no truck with Martin Luther King. Uh, oh no no no! You you don't get to follow your conscience over the civil laws. Go back to the state of nature with that stuff. Um, it hath also been caught that faith and sanctity are not to be attained by study and reason, but by supernatural institution. Remember, re religion is a major source of uh, instability and particularly prophets who claim to understand someone like Joan of Arc would be terrible because that person claims to have a direct line to God and can attract all kinds of followers. We've got to inoculate people against those kind of uh, charismatic leaders. We've got to teach them that n that's unchristian. Anybody who says that to you is not Christian and you shouldn't listen to them. Um, he that hath the sovereign power is subject to the civil laws. No, again, uh, that is a seditious doctrine. To say that the president is uh, not above the law is bad, says um, 
Hobbes, they are above the law. They're not above the law of nature because anyone in the state of nature has to follow that. And uh, rulers are in the state of nature with respect to one another. But um, they don't have to follow the civil laws. Every man has an absolute property in his goods. Libertarians, mm, seditious doctrine. You can't follow that. That's uh, near the bottom of the first column on page 427. Next one, that the sovereign power may be divided. We've seen his problem with that. Uh, he, I like this, the danger of reading the classics. Don't read Greek and Roman philosophy, for God's sake. Uh, that will lead you to all kinds of falsehoods. Like, for example, the falsehood that... Um, uh, I, we've missed that part. Another, another beef that... Yes, this is on page 422 in chapter 21. Aristotle claims that in democracy, liberty is to be supposed, for it is commonly held, that no man is free in any other government. Uh, Hobbes says absolutely not. It is not true that you are free in a democracy and not free in a monarchy. Both, you, are, you can be equally free in both because freedom is, uh, is simply absence of restrictions. And if you have a democracy that has a lot of laws, you're less free than you're if you're in a monarchy where the monarchs is fairly laissez-faire. So it's absolutely not true to say that you are more free in a democracy. And of course, someone who says that is going to lead to uh, anti-monarchist sentiment. A um, couple more, uh, as you can see. Uh, lastly, the very last paragraph that we're given in this in our excerpt on page 430. When in a war, the enemies get a final victory. Uh, so the forces of the Commonwealth keeping the field no longer. There is no farther protection of subjects in their loyalty. Then is the Commonwealth dissolved. This is how Commonwealth ceased to be. And every man at liberty to protect himself as much as such courses his own discretion shall suggest him. For the sovereign is the public soul giving life and motion to the commonwealth, which expiring, the members are governed by it no more. And of course, another reason for this is because if the sovereign is defeated, then the sovereign cannot serve the purpose for whom they were, for which they were instituted, which is to protect and decide. So at that moment, uh, the whole reason for the sovereignty existing to, dissolves and you, you, you're you back to the state of nature again. You, you Every man for himself. All right, that was very long, but I hope that helps put the, uh, I hope that helped you with the reading that you got in Khan.